All right, Tom, uh, still there? Are you yep. Okay, cool. right here. Is audio sound good? Levels good? Yeah. Everything sounds good. So it's uh, it's 11. We're up to uh, 12 attendees. I think maybe we'll wait another half a minute or so and just see if we uh, get a few more people trickling in, and then we'll we'll get started. So good. Sounds good. All right, great. If you want to queue up your first slide and, you know, when you've uh, got things finished there. Okay. Um, uh, I think I'm just going to leave this up here. I don't I don't go with a lot of slides, so okay. I could, well, I could show right. them some pictures, but this will be good enough to start. It sounds good. All right. So we're up to we're up to 14 now. So uh, we'll get started. Uh, my name is Jason Key. I'm uh, with SB Grid here at Harvard Medical School, and uh, happy to introduce Tom Goddard at UCSF, who's going to take us through uh, using U UCSF Chimera to analyze macromolecular assemblies. So take it away, Tom. Okay. Oh, one so, more thing. I, so sorry to interrupt. Uh, yeah, yeah. Tom has let it be known that uh, if people have questions, they can chat them in real time as we go through the software. It may be better to uh, interject a question while we're covering something. So. If you um, if you're not on the audio, you can uh, send a chat to the host or to the presenter, uh, and I can interrupt Tom, or maybe uh, Tom can stop and, and address those things as we go. Otherwise, you can also ask questions at the end. There'll be some time at the end. So, all right, go ahead, Tom. Yeah, Jason. Yeah, if you can watch the questions, because I my desktop is going to be filled with other stuff, so I might I probably won't be able to see them. But if you just great. relay them to me, that will be great. So we'll do. Uh, <clears throat> I've come into UCSF. Uh, so in California, it's only eight here. Nobody is in my office. It's very strange. I don't get here usually this early. Um, so it's kind of nice. Um, I'm going to show you the software that my lab develops. There are five of us who developed this program called Chimera, and it's used uh, for looking at 3D molecular models, uh, viewing them, analyzing them, uh, making images and movies that you would use in a, uh, as figures in journal, uh, journal article or movies as supplementary material, also use in talks, so presentation type illustrating the results of your, your work on molecular structures. Um, Chimera has hundreds of capabilities for doing analysis of structures, and I'm only going to be able to show you a few in this, this next 20 minutes. So let me start off by showing you where you could find more information about Chimera. So let's, let's just quickly go to the Chimera website. Uh, let me show you how to find that. We'll just go to Google here and search for Chimera. It's the third entry here, UCSF Chimera. And so this is the Chimera web page. And one of these five people who developed the program uh, full-time works on documentation. So there's a ton of documentation. And if you look under the documentation link on the left, you'll find a whole index of different things. If you're primarily interested in the topic we're going to cover today, molecular assemblies or electron microscopy data, let me show you the two most uh, useful pieces of documentation, I think, for finding out what the program can do. One is this guide to volume data. Again, there's a little link on the left. Click that. And it has uh, pictures and short descriptions of how to do lots of things, segmentation, um, fitting molecular models into density maps, uh, filtering density maps. Okay, so by volume data, it means like density map data. Electron microscopy is the, is the main source for looking at the molecular assemblies. Uh, but it can be other sources like crystallography. The, other, the one other place where uh, you'll find a lot of information that, about how to use the program for molecular assemblies is if you go to this link, as tutorials and videos. If we go to the videos link, these are uh, a lot of screen capture videos, uh, mostly of me using Chimera to do particular tasks. So it shows you step by step how to do a bunch of different 
uh, kinds of things, clipping a virus to a spherical shell, for instance. Okay, so you'll find a lot more document, types of documentation on the website here, um, but that's all I'm going to show you right now. And the rest of the time, we'll, we'll try to do a little task and a little analysis task in Chimera. Okay, so I was playing around in Chimera. I'm going to quit and start from the beginning. So let me quit that Chimera and start it up. We just made a release of Chimera, Chimera 1.7. It came out about a week ago. We make a release about once a year, so this is good timing. What I'm going to show you is how to build a model of alpha crystalline. And we're going to use X-ray structure of the protein alpha crystalline. And it assembles into a big assembly, and we're going to use electron microscopy to get that shape of that assembly. So first, let me load the electron microscopy, uh, the density map. I'll just fetch it from the uh, electron EM data bank, electron microscopy data bank. I happen to know the ID is 1776. And here's what it looks like. Brought up a little dialogue on the right here that shows a histogram of the values in this in this density map. Here's what the alpha crystalline structure looks like. This is 24 copies of the alpha crystalline protein. This was obtained by imaging about 2,500 different particles of uh, and, and then reconstructing a three-dimensional volume from them. Um, <clears throat> So let me tell you a little bit about where what alpha crystalline does and where it's found. Alpha crystalline is in the lens of your eye. And it's, in fact, about 50% of the protein in the lens of your eye. Um, and what it does is it captures proteins that become unfolded. So you get a lot of ultraviolet light shining on your eye. It damages proteins in there. And this alpha crystalline will capture those before they become too badly unfolded so that they can be refolded. And this is very important because your eye lens doesn't have a way to reproduce, to produce, to um, cycle through and make new protein, these new proteins. And so they've got to last your whole lifetime. So having proteins that are going to last you 80 years is a big, is a big challenge. Okay, so we're going to look at, we're going to try to build a structure uh, from this electron microscopy, and we're going to try to <clears throat> get a little bit of hint of how it func how it performs this function of capturing unfolded proteins. All right, so let me show you what the atomic model an atomic model of the the monomeric protein looks like um, obtained from crystallography. So again, I'm going to use this fetch by ID to directly fetch the model this time from the protein data bank. And from browsing the Protein Data Bank website, I know 3L1G is a copy of alpha crystalline. It appeared off at the periphery. Okay, here it is. Let me hide the density map. I'll use this little button on the volume dialog above the histogram. So here's what the alpha crystalline protein looks like. We have two beta sheets. In yellow, you see some sul some sulfate ions. Uh, you see a long tail, a long C-terminal tail here. So as I said, I want to um, <clears throat> make this big cage-like assembly that the alpha crystalline forms. I want to make a model of it. And um, I get, the first thing I really need to know is, is how does this protein bind to itself? Okay, that density doesn't show me the shape of I don't see the protein in that density very well because the resolution isn't good enough. It's only 20 angstroms resolution. So I need more information. How does this protein bind to itself? So one way to find that out is this, this uh, protein was crystallized, and I can look at the crystal unit cell for this particular atomic model that I've loaded and see how it contacts itself in the, in the crystal. So let's do that. Um, I'll go to Tools and Higher Order Structure, and here Unit Cell. I'll bring up another dialog, and I'll just tell it to make the copies in the unit cell. And I can say show the outline of the unit cell. Okay. So I see six copies of the molecule in the unit cell. 
we look at just this pink, these two pinkish, pink and purple ones, we can see how they bind to each other. And you'll see that uh, the sort of red, the reddish, pinkish uh, C-terminal tail kind of reaches across and binds to this purple copy sort of along the edge of the two beta sheets. And it looks like it's a symmetrical relation. You see the purple tail coming across and binding to the, the reddish copy. OK, that's one way it binds. It turns out there's another way that the protein binds to itself that we can see in this crystal. But we need to show more than one unit cell of the crystal. So let me go over here to the little unit cell dialog and click Options. And I'll show a second unit cell. Okay. And now if we look, say, at the green and uh, purple, green and, you know, green and kind of bluish copy here, we see another way that the protein binds to itself. Let me flip it over and look at the other side. Okay, so here I see two copies of the protein binding, um, kind of like one beta sheet extends another beta sheet. They bind sort of edge to edge. All right, so that's the second way the protein binds to, uh, to itself. Uh, if I were really serious about doing this and not just doing a quick demo for you, I'd want to explore this question more. How does the protein bind to itself? And there are other structures in the protein data bank, and I would look at all of them. So let me just show you the first step. How would I find all of these structures of alpha crystalline in the protein data bank? Um, so I would just do a sequence search. If I go to Tools, Sequence, and then Blast Protein. Blast is uh, the standard sequence-based searching method. And it says use chain A of the 3L1G. We'll use its sequence and blast against the protein data bank. I'll hit OK. This is going off and using a web service, a web service provided here at UC San Francisco. It just sent a request, and here are the results. There are about a dozen structures that have very similar sequence to this alpha crystalline that I loaded. And we'll see the three L1G at the top. And I could just select all of these guys and say load them. Um, to save us the time, let me just select one of them and load it. Uh, you can see a little description on the right, and you'll see that some of these alpha crystallines are from human, some from, here's one from zebrafish, from cow, rat, so we have some from different species. I'll just choose a different human uh, alpha crystalline and ask it to load that one. Okay, it appeared over here on the left. Let me hide the crystal copies so that we can see what the new structure more clearly hide the outline of the crystal unit cell. So it loaded this big green structure. Its asymmetric unit has multiple copies. Looks like about five, five or six copies. And when it loaded it, it aligned it with my original 3L1G alpha crystalline. That's in blue here. Okay. One thing we see in this uh, different structure is we see the same um, binding mode that we just looked at, where the two proteins bind edge to edge. All right, so that's a way to find the other structures, and you can explore for hours what those structures look like. Um, let's go back. Now let's go try to build the assembly, given this knowledge. So um, first I'm going to close the new, uh, this, this second uh, structure that I just opened, 2WJ7. Let me close that one. I'm going to go back and uh, show my unit cell, my unit cell copies. And I want to fit, I'm going to, one of, my strategy is going to be to take the dimer, the two edge-to-edge -edge, um, copies of the protein, and fit that, that unit into the electron microscopy. The reason I'm do, going to do this um, is because that uh, EM density map has 12-fold symmetry, and yet I want to fit 24 copies in. Um, 
So I, there are two copies that are in different positions in the map. I need to fit two unique positions in the map, and then I can use the symmetry to replicate it and get all 24 copies. Okay, so I'm going to take this dimer in the middle. Now they're colored green. When I made them this time, it gave them a new set of random colors. Let me select the two in the middle, and I'm going to combine those into a single molecule with two chains. I'll do that with a command. This is just to make it simpler for me to fit if I make them a single molecule instead of two molecules. So the command is combine, and I'll say combine SEL, the selected things. Those are shown in the green outline. I selected those with the mouse. Okay, and then I'll hide my, co I'll, uh, let's see, delete my unit cell copies. There in white is this combination I just formed. I'm going to delete the original copy of the protein. All right, good. I'll bring back the display of our map. Here, here it is. Let me change the color of the this uh, dimer that we're going to fit so that it doesn't uh, blend in with the color of the map so much. Okay, good. And now let's try to build the, the assembly. So I'm going to just stick this copy of the atomic model, the X-ray structure, into the density map. Over here in model panel, I'm going to click a little button under the A column. That means active. I'll turn that off for the map, and that means the map won't move when I uh, drag things around with the mouse. So I've only got the atomic model moving. And I'll just stick it in the map in a place where it looks like it fits. Let me make the map transparent so that uh, we can see it inside, see the, the x-ray structure inside. Okay, that looks good. And let me let the map move again. Okay, so I've placed it there. Oh, it's not so good. Let me rotate it a little bit. Let's see. Yeah, okay, that's better. So I can place it by hand. Um, one imp very important criteria if I'm making a symmetric model is uh, to know that will help me judge whether this is the correct position is if I look at the symmetric copies um, of the molecule, do they clash with each other? This is usually a pretty strong constraint on how they, they pack, the clashes between the symmetric copies. So how do I, let's create those symmetric copies. First, I need to figure out the symmetry of the map. So I'll use a command. Uh, it's here at the bottom, measure symmetry, uh, number zero. The number zero is the just numeric identifier for the map. It's shown in the model panel here. This will figure out the symmetry, Chimera will figure out the symmetry of the map. Whoops, unrecognized command, quote. Maybe I have something, let's try that once more time. Maybe I typed some hidden character, no, let's see, quote, number zero. Okay, there we go. Um, at the very bottom of the window, it reported some results here, it said, uh, the map has tetrahedral symmetry, and it found the center grid point in the density map. Now that it knows the symmetry, I can use that to make symmetric copies of the, of the atomic model. So I'll say sim to make these symmetric copies. Let me give it the number, number 13, for our dim dimer model. And the symmetry group is the symmetry of the map. So I give it number zero. And um, let me add one more little option here, update true. That's, that little option says, if I move the original copy of my dimer, update the positions of all the new symmetric copies. So let's do that. All right, so now we have a bunch of copies. Let me color them diff distinctly from each other so we can see them more clearly. Okay, so this is what the symmetric version looks like. Maybe I'll hide the map. All right, so that looks good. Let me show you this little updating business. So if I move 
uh, my original copy was this red one. Let me, in the model panel, say move, allow me to move only the red one. Say activate only. And then when I move it, the red one here, all the other ones are just going to move to match the symmetry of the map. Okay, that's kind of a cool thing. Go back to activate all. And let me show you the map again. Okay, so I just placed this uh, this dimer by hand, which is, uh, well, that's the first, uh, first shot at it, but we really want it to match the density as well as possible. So let me show you uh, how to optimize its fit in the density. So we'll do a rigid motion of it that makes it match the density as well as possible in the, uh, it's a local optimization. So it will do just, given its current position, it will find locally the best orientation that fits in the density map. So we'll go to tools, this little tool is called Fit and Map, the one that does the optimization. Uh, we'll say fit um, our original copy, which was model number 13, into the density map. And I press this fit button. And it just jumped to a new position. The red one jumped, and then all the other ones were moved to follow the symmetry. Okay, it does look like it fits in the, the envelope of the density better. If I hit this little undo, you can see where we started with, what we started with. So we have that, and then redo here. The optimization jumped us to this. Okay, um, this fit just the single copy. I told it to fit the red copy. So it didn't take into account the potential clashes between the other copies. Um, and uh, in general, if I'm fitting a symmetric model, Kind of a better a better way of optimizing is let me look at all 12 copies of the dimer and let me adjust the positions so that the whole thing matches the entire density map. All right, this can this will this is especially helpful in avoiding clashes between the different copies. Let me show you how to do that. You can't do that in the dialog, um, but I can do it in a command. The commands in Chimera often have some more powerful options than the, the di little dialog windows. So I'll say fit number 13, our dimer, into the map number zero. And then I'll say sim true. It says use the symmetry of the map, okay? And I need to give one more option to tell it the resolution of the map. Let's say it's 20 angstroms. That's just necessary for doing this fitting of all of the copies to the map. Um, it uses a correlation metric. So let's run that command. Okay, just took a second there, and they jumped to a new position, which optimizes the match of all of the 12 dimers. Let's see, let me, where's my fitting dialog here? Okay, if I say undo, let's see what, and redo. So it changed quite a bit again. It made a, a quite different uh, orientation for the fit. Okay, um, what, what would our next step be? I'm not going to be able to do all the steps to make this this model the way you know the best model I can because that takes more than 20 minutes too. Um, but what would I look at next? Well. Um, if you look at what we've got so far, we've got a bunch of dimers, and they're more or less floating uh, independent of each other. They're not packed tight together, so they're not going to be able to hold together into an assembly the way it's currently modeled. Um, but remember, when we looked at the unit cell, we saw a different way that the proteins bind to each other, and that is using these C-terminal tails. Okay, in, in what I've got here, they're all just sticking out in space. But my next step would be, uh, in trying to build this model, uh, I think maybe these C-terminal tails are what hold the whole thing together. And so I would take this red C-terminal tail here, and I would try to buy, place it on a neighboring dimer, say this yellow one, in exactly the location I saw in the X-ray crystallography data. 
Okay, so I I would move say the the last five residues of the, this red C terminal tail to exactly the binding location on this yellow copy of the dimer. I'll just use a command to do that, and then that would create a very large huge um, bond between the five residues and then the remaining part of the protein that I didn't move at all. And I would use a little energy minimization to fix that long bond. So it would move the other parts of the C-terminal tail to, to produce reasonable geometry. And then I could just replicate that structure 12 times. Um, actually, these dimers, since they're two monomers, they're two tails. So I would connect up both tails in some pattern to make this cage. Okay, so I don't have time to show you that. That would be another 15 minutes of messing around. So we're going to skip that, and we're going to jump right to some questions about how, how, would this, how might this assembly function, uh, have this chaperone activity where it captures unfolded proteins in the, in your, the lens of your eye. Um, to take a look at that, I want to look at the hydrophobicity of, um, of th this assembly. Which regions are hydrophobic? Which regions are hydrophilic? So I'm going to do that with this presets menu. Uh, this just shows some standard ways of displaying it. And here it says hydrophobicity surface. Let me just click that one. That will make surfaces of all 12 dimers, and it will color them according to hydrophobic regions and hydrophilic regions. Uh, so we'll just take a few seconds here to compute those surfaces. Okay. So we've got molecular surfaces here, and blue is hydrophilic, likes to be exposed to the water, and orange is the hydrophobic regions. The reason I'm interested in this is because when a protein um, unfolds, it exposes hydrophobic regions. So if I got some denatured protein near this complex, um, it's going to have hydrophobic regions, and it wants to bury those hydrophobic regions uh, by packing them with other hydrophobic regions. Um, if we did that little uh, pre part of the uh, uh, modeling that I just described, where we placed the tails, the C-terminal tails, um, we would find that those tails actually lie in the little orange groove that you see on these surfaces. Okay, see there's a line of orange, and we see many copies. Every monomer has one, basically all of the orange, all of the hydrophobic part is lined up. And the C-terminal tail sits right there covering that orange groove. And you can imagine that if I have a nearby unfolded protein, and it has hydrophobic regions, it might displace one of these C-terminal tails from its orange uh, groove, and it might bind there. And there's some interesting experimental observation that when this alpha crystalline is capturing unfolded proteins, the cage-like structure of these copy, many copies of the dimer, it falls apart. And that would agree with this sort of concept we have that the tails, C-terminal tails, hold it together. And if they were displaced, the C-terminal tails were displaced because some denatured protein was competing for the binding hydrophobic binding site, then the thing would fall apart. Okay, so that's an idea of how the thing function, what might function uh, that we can kind of uh, try to figure out from this from this model that we've built. All right, so that, I'm, I'm out of time. Uh, we have a few more minutes if you have questions. Um, uh, if you have questions, you can type them, and uh, Jason or Piotr yeah, will. Right. Yeah, uh, anyone who has questions, you can chat them to either uh, me or Tom, and uh, you know, or I think you can chat to all panelists or within the chat window. And I'll give people a little bit of time if they want to uh, type in a few questions. I've I've got a couple. Um, sure. Tom, so when uh, the way that uh, the the program deals with symmetry is really impressive to me. I think uh, you know that's uh, you know that's that's really great. When it does uh, place atoms. Uh, and they clash. Is there uh, some threshold where it won't tolerate clashes, or it, it'll tolerate any amount of clash, or do you get a warning, or yeah, is, so is it purely visual? Chimera is, is, is pretty, in one sense, it's dumb, but then it's also, this is kind of powerful. It doesn't care about any clashes you make. 
I can put a protein right on top of another protein. It's not going to warn me or actually do anything for me. Um, uh, there are some tools, though, like I showed you the fitting, which um, moved them to avoid the clashes. Okay, they mo it moved um, one copy of the dimer in the density map to avoid clashes with other copies. I mean, it was just a calculation that did that. There's also a tool called Find Clashes, which will graphically display the clashes between the different between different proteins. That tool is here under Tools. Let's see. I'd say, uh, yeah, Structure and, al and Binding Analysis, Find Clashes. And it will display like a lot of yellow lines between the clashing parts of the structure. It won't move them apart for you, though. Um, so there's actually there's not a lot of capability in Chimera to resolve clashes automatically. The thing I showed you, this fitting using symmetry, is one is is maybe the best example of that, of an automatic way to resolve the clashes. Great. Uh, we I have one question just came in through the chat sure. from uh, Jin Kui Duan, who uh, is asking how to fit a PDB into an asymmetric uh, volume data. Okay. So if you have some asymmetric volume and you want to replace these, I guess you're yeah. So, um, so we use symmetry here. If you have an, a map that doesn't have symmetry, um, and I have say two different proteins that need to fit into that map, um, I can fit them the proteins one at a time. Okay, fit the first protein, fit the second protein. But if they don't take into account the the kind of clashes between them, then it might decide to fit both of them in the same location. Um, so how would you take into account um, like fit, fitting both of them together? Well, there's a, there's a thing called sequential fitting that Chimera does. Uh, the, Chimera, the Chimera fit command, the same command, but it's an option. And um, uh, we could find out about this option by typing help fit. Or no, I think the full map command is called fit map, help fit map. And this would bring up the Chimera manual page. Here at the top, it says something about sequential fitting. Okay. The, the gist of the sequential fitting is it fits the, it, you have two copies of the protein and they're placed in the map in some way. You subtract off the second copy from the map and you fit the first copy. Okay. Taking into a, in the map with the second copy subtracted. Then you fit the second copy, subtracting the, the part of the map represented by the first copy. And then you go back and forth. It's sort of an iterative procedure. Okay, That takes care of the clashes, because each time you subtract off that part of the map that the other copy is filling. If you want to see how to do this, so you could read the documentation about how to do it. That's pretty difficult. Like, well, it will take you some time to figure that out. Um, but if we just go to the Chimera website and we go to the video section, there's a video that shows exactly how to do this. So I'll go to the video, and there's a section on fitting down here. And let's see, this one called sequential fitting. Um, we'll just show you step by step an example of doing this fitting into an asymmetric map. So that's how I would suggest uh, like learning how to do it in Chimera. Great. So it sounds like uh, some aspects of that could even be used in symmetric fitting, right? It seems like you um, you could use that subtraction to be able to display sort of residual volumes or something that you're not fitting. Is that Yeah, possible? sure. And that's a, yeah. I mean, with the symmetric fitting, the reason I use that sequential fitting for the asymmetric map um, well, it's because I don't have the symmetry. If I have the symmetry, I generally wouldn't use the sequential fitting because that will end up positioning the proteins in a way that doesn't exactly match the symmetry. So if I have the asymmetry, I have sort of more information, and I want to use that. Um, you're right about the residuals. Uh, like, in the end, if I made a model and I wanted to compare the um, two maps, this deal of subtracting um, would would help me see where there are discrepancies between my atomic model and the actual electron microscopy. So I would make a simulated map of the atomic model. For instance, mall map, here's a command to do that, at 20 angstroms resolution. 
and I make a simulated map, and I would subtract that from the experimental map. Again, there would be another command to do that, VOP subtract number whatever this map is that was just created, map number two from the experimental map. Um, and then I could see that will produce a new map, and I can see the places where they disagree, okay, where the difference, the residual is the largest. Great. Yeah, I mean, you could imagine ways where you could, you know, if you have more more than one protein in your complex and you're trying to figure out, you know, where, you know, protein B is and you're placing protein A, you could use residuals or something to sort of look yeah. for those. So reasons, that's yeah, that sequential fitting method I described to you, it's all automated. So I described it okay. sort of step by step, but you just type one command and it does 10 iterations back and forth, fitting each one and subtracting the other. Um, but you can do the steps by hand, too and like see what's really going on as you do that. You can do each step individually in Chimera too. Great. Well, uh, if there's no more questions, uh, I think we're, we're getting uh, a little long in time. I'd yeah. like to thank Tom for uh, your great webinar. It's really, really cool stuff. I mean, that's a really impressive uh, package. I mean, I know that Chimera can do a lot more than uh, what we talked about today, but it's uh, it's, you yeah, there are a million really capabilities easy. there. So uh, if you're, this is really just a, a small example of what it's capable of. Great. All right. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Thanks a lot for listening, everybody.